For the first time in more than seven months, SpaceX has just kicked off the most ambitious round of tests for its fully stacked launch system ahead of its debut orbital launch attempt scheduled for as soon as later this year. The testing started in earnest on October 25th with some partial cryo-testing on the Booster 7 slash Ship 24 full stack. The tests, where the flammable propellant was replaced with a similarly cold cryogenic fluid that's similar enough to subject a rocket to similar thermal and mechanical stresses on the Starship full stack. And as expected, on the next day, more cryo-testing with the full stack of Booster 7 and Ship 24 was underway. We can see here the frost line rising on the B-7 and S-24. Although this test SpaceX subjected Starship to was by no means ambitious, the first test of the first fully integrated prototype of a new rocket to fly into orbit is still an immensely significant achievement, particularly so for the largest rocket ever built. Beyond the basic mechanical demonstration that Super Heavy Booster 7 is strong enough to support a partially loaded Starship, which probably wasn't in doubt, it's likely that the main purpose of this first full-stack crowd proof was to ensure that all the systems required to fuel Starship on top of Super Heavy were working as expected. That's no small feat given that Starship is both the tallest and largest upper stage ever assembled. To fully fuel a Starship for an orbital launch, which takes around 1200 tons of propellants or liquid nitrogen for a cryo-proof, it's equivalent to the weight of more than two entire Falcon 9 rockets and must be pumped around 85 meters up Star Base's integration tower. That requires thousands of feet of plumbing and a symphony of giant valves and pumps, all of which must work in concert and without leaking, jamming, or freezing to fuel the Starship. As such, the first full-stack cryoproof was just as much or more of a test of the orbital launch site's launch-slash-integration tower and tank farm. However, that first test is just the start of a long process, and it's likely that SpaceX will attempt an increasingly ambitious series of tests that feature the full Starship stack over the next few days. This week, SpaceX still ordered two possible road closures, one at 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Thursday and another at 6 to 2 p.m. on Friday. Notably, the orbital launch mount has appeared with some new leg shielding. SpaceX is really preparing everything for a big fire. The test campaign is expected to begin with the first full wet dress rehearsal of a two-stage Starship, meaning that the rocket will be fully loaded with thousands of tons of liquid methane and oxygen propellant and run through a simulated launch countdown that ends just before engine ignition. If successful, SpaceX will likely restart Booster 7 static fire testing and continue to work its way up to the first simultaneous ignition of all 33 of its Raptor 2 engines. If both milestones, which include a full WDR and 33 engine static fire, are completed without significant issues, there's a chance that SpaceX could move directly into preparations for Starship's first orbital launch attempt without unstacking the rocket. But what's more interesting, the biggest Starship test campaign begins as SpaceX is also gearing up for the first Falcon Heavy launch since 2019. SpaceX has linked up the three boosters that comprise the first stage of its Falcon Heavy rocket in preparation for an upcoming liftoff from Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Simultaneously, workers have completed the equally important task of converting 39A's transporter slash erector, or T&E, which has been configured for single-core Falcon 9 rockets for over three years. The transporter slash erectors SpaceX uses for Falcon launches are a bit like a mobile backbone and launch tower combined. Their first purpose is to transport horizontal Falcon rockets to and from their integration hangars and launch pads. They're also tasked with racing Falcon rockets to a vertical position and lowering them back down for transport or worker access. Most importantly, they connect to a pad's ground systems and distribute propellant, gases, power, and communications to Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy through multiple umbilicals and quick disconnect ports. Falcon Heavy, which can only be launched out of LC-39A, has three times as many boosters as Falcon 9 and necessitates significant modifications to the pad's T&E when switching between the two. The process is much harder when moving from F9 to FH, and waiting almost three and a half years between Falcon Heavy launches likely hasn't made the conversion any easier. But on October 23rd, after numerous tests and weeks of work, the Pad 39A T&E picked up the reaction frame that attaches to the bottom of Falcon rockets and was brought horizontal. 
Thanks to the nature of Falcon Heavy and Pad 39A's infrastructure, what happens next is more or less guaranteed. During normal Falcon 9 operations, 39A's integration hangar is large enough for two or three unrelated Falcon boosters to remain, while the T&E rolls inside to pick up a full Falcon 9. More importantly, Falcon 9's booster and upper stage can technically be integrated off to the side and craned onto the T&E when ready. But with Falcon Heavy, which has a first stage akin to three Falcon 9 boosters sitting side by side, there isn't enough room inside the hangar to integrate the rocket with the T&E inside. For Falcon Heavy, the T&E can thus only roll back into the hangar once the rocket's three boosters and upper stage have been fully assembled and are suspended in mid-air. SpaceX's October 23rd photo shows that three of the four cranes required for that lift appear to already be in position, further confirming that T&E rollback is imminent. Once the T&E rolls back to the hangar and Falcon Heavy is attached, the rocket will eventually be transported to the pad and brought vertical for wet dress rehearsal and static fire testing. The U.S. Space Force's USSF-44 payload, which is a mysterious pair of satellites that are more than two years behind schedule, will almost certainly not be installed on Falcon Heavy during pre-launch testing. So the rocket will need to roll back to the hangar at least once more after testing to have its payload fairing attached. Combined, that pre-launch process could easily take a week or more. Multiple sources report that Falcon Heavy is scheduled to launch no earlier than 9.44 AM EDT or 13.44 UTC on Halloween, October 31st. But even if the rocket rolls out today on October 27th, the odds are stacked against Falcon Heavy sailing through its first integrated pre-launch tests in 40 months, and delays are quite likely. For Falcon Heavy's fourth launch, all three of the rocket's boosters B-1064, B-1065, and B-1066 are new, as are its upper stage and payload fairing. An FCC permit for the launch has confirmed that SpaceX will intentionally expend the rocket's new center core while its twin side boosters will attempt a near simultaneous landing back at Cape Canaveral. USSF-44 will be SpaceX's first attempted launch directly to geostationary orbit, an exceptionally challenging mission that requires the rocket's upper stage to coast in space for around 4-6 to six hours between two major burns. And if all goes successfully, Falcon Heavy will insert the USSF-44's mystery satellites into a circular orbit at around 35,600 kilometers or around 22,150 miles above Earth's surface. At that altitude, orbital velocity matches Earth's rotation and spacecraft can effectively hover indefinitely above their region of choice. So let's go ahead and start the countdown. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and please don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section down below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality content like this one. So thank you so much again, and we hope to see you again next time.